Good evening, everybody. Uh, we'll just wait a few minutes for everybody to arrive, but uh, welcome to uh, day four of the mental wealth lesson. Um, we'll be starting in a, a few seconds. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to day four of the Mental Wealth Festival um, and tonight's panel discussion on the creative arts, well-being, and mental health. Um, my name is Ian Tucknott. I am head of school for the humanities and sciences at City Lit. Um, and it's our absolute pleasure to be hosting tonight's panel discussion with four incredible panelists. Um, without further ado, let me introduce our lineup for this evening. Um, first of all, we have author Rowan Husayo Buchanan. Rowan's first novel, Harmless Like You, won the Authors Club First Novel Award, a Betty Task Award, and was shortlisted for the Desmond Elliott Prize. Her second novel, The Fantastic Starling Days, was published by SEPTA last year and was shortlisted for the Costa Novel Award. Starling Days explores themes of depression and suicide as the character of Mina and her husband search for ways of managing and understanding Mina's struggle with her mental health. Her work has appeared in Granta, The Atlantic and The Paris Review. We also welcome this evening artist Mark Titchener. Mark was nominated for the Turner Prize in 2006, participated in the Venice Biennale in 2007, and was artist in residence at the Art Gallery of Ontario, Toronto in 2012. Mark's work involves an exploration of the tensions between the different belief systems that inform our society, be they religious, scientific, or political. Focusing on an exploration of words and language, in recent years, much of his production has been based in the public realm, both in the UK and internationally. Many of our audience members may be familiar with Mark's project, Please Believe These Days Will Pass, produced during the early days of lockdown, where poster and billboard versions of this artwork appeared in hundreds of sites in cities around the UK and consequently on social media. We also welcome artist Simon English. Simon emerged on the London art scene in 1994 with an exhibition of paintings at the Saatchi Gallery as part of Young British Art 3. Simon is best known for his large scale and small scale works on paper, which have been referred to as Diaries of the Subconscious. His most recent solo exhibition at the Trans Palette Center of Contemporary Art in Bourges in 2020 incorporated drawings, sculpture, and works on canvas. Simon's work has appeared in exhibitions in the UK and internationally, and in March 2018, the artist's book Simon English, My Big Self Decoy Justin Bieber was launched in the UK by Black Dog Publishing. And finally, last but not least, we welcome Keith Clapson. Keith is trustee of the Friends of the Anxiety Disorders and Residential Unit at Bethlehem Hospital, one of our festival partners this year, and he volunteers at Bethlehem as well as Stonewall. Keith spent many years struggling with OCD, which left him largely isolated and unable to live a normal life until 2017, when Keith spent four months at the unit for which he is now trustee, undergoing life-changing therapy, and in the process, rediscovered his passion for art and learning, which have become an essential part of Keith's recovery. Keith speaks regularly on OCD, mental health, and creativity, and is an outspoken advocate for positive well-being and adult learning. Keith is currently developing his practice as a ceramic artist. So as you can see from the intro, it's an incredible lineup this evening. Um, we will start with, with a, an organized discussion between the panelists, um, and then towards the end for the last 15 minutes, we will be taking um, a number of questions um, from you, our audience. Um, if you would like to submit a question, um, please do so in the Q&A box, which you should find on your screen. 
Um, unfortunately, with the amount of people we have watching today, we will not be able to answer all of your questions, um, but we'll try to, to summarize and, and, and address a few of these um, towards the end of our panel discussion this evening. So without further ado, uh, let's start our conversation, everybody. Welcome. <clears throat> so um, let's begin with the obvious, in a sense. Um, the past seven months, um, a very sort of strange and, and surreal period um, for us all. Um, so I'm really interested, just as an introduction, of, 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 of our panellists' experience of the lockdown and potentially its impact on you in terms of, of your creative work and, and your practice. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll ask Rowan, first of all, our author on the panel. How, how was your lockdown? You know, it has to be said, um, I have been very lucky. Um, my family had some health scares at the time, actually not COVID, but it's quite hard, it stressful to have a health scare during this time. And I was very worried for them, but they seem okay now. And that's, I'm just immensely grateful for that. I think sort of on a personal and creative level, I just gotten the momentum going on a project when all of this began. I was also about to go on book tour in America, which I did not do for very obvious reasons. So my life sort of went into this new direction and I, like many people, not everyone, found it quite hard to write and make in those first couple of months. And I ended up, I'd been commissioned to do some work. So just focusing on somebody has told me to do this. I will do this. It is almost like homework. It has a deadline. I will keep going, but the big project I was very deeply emotionally involved with, I couldn't connect to anymore for several months. And actually only this last week did I print it out and begin reading it through. And I have realized that the entire thing needs to be changed from the third person to the first person, which is a delight and a joy. So <laughs> there is that. Thank you, Rowan. Um... How about, how about you, Mark? I know you, your, your project, Please Believe These Days Will Pass, probably took up a large, <laughs> a large bit of your, your experience in the last seven months. Um, how, how, was, how how's it been for you? Um, yeah, I mean, very much this, the same as, uh, you know, kind of experience really of, um, I suppose, initially being very much more concerned with what was happening with family and, you know, getting used to, that kind of separation, getting used to ho homeschooling was a big part of it for me, um, half of the time. Um, and also I was still teaching, finishing off my sort of teaching term at the Royal College. So that was a, a big, you know, leap into the unknown, really, becoming almost like a mentor rather than a, a tutor through that. Um, in terms of work, I this project you, you mentioned happened and in a way it was a kind of it seemed like I was doing a lot of work when actually I wasn't. It was a good way of like seemingly being quite busy um, making, but actually I think what happened was I felt a lot of questions were asked about what I was doing and the way I was thinking about um, what I do. Uh, most of my work's in the public realm, and of course that suddenly became a completely different place. And then as we went through lockdown and the um, Black Lives Matter movement happened and George Floyd's um, murder, there was the kind of, again, this sort of big, big questions about the kind of voices that should be in the public realm. So it's been a period of trying to think about difficult questions and uh, one that, you know, and no, none of which I've resolved at all. So I'm, I'm still kind of slightly in a st state of uh, creative paralysis, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sounds uh, maybe similar to Rowan that, that that pause within your work. Yeah, it's it's interesting that uh, you know in a sense uh, many of us I think have experienced that shift in role and and shifting identities, becoming teacher or or, the, or you know for, for for our children or, or or you know taking on those those different roles and voices. Um, si Simon, how 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 about you? Um, uh it suddenly feels a long time ago. Uh, I was saying earlier, you know, the start of lockdown, and um, you know, it was a kind of an excitement in a way. Um, I, I strangely felt like I'd been preparing my whole life um, for this moment. Um, I uh, was happy with isolation on a creative point of view, uh, a simple life for a complicated person, but the things around me weren't simple at all. And my mother was in hospital when 
COVID uh, when lockdown started. And, you know, this was an agonizing moment of uh, not being able to see her anymore. And, um, and you know, that impacted quite heavily on me. Um, I'd also started a new relationship at the beginning of lockdown or a few weeks before. So things were sort of very close or very far. I kept writing um, words like, I can't go there, which, which meant on so many levels, things I didn't dare open up. Also myself in my studio, um, terrified to go there in a sense, because I knew I couldn't get too rattled because I wouldn't have my usual escape routes to sort of un unravel them. And I had to stay fairly calm. The in terms of sort of songs, weirdly enough, you know, that song, Let It Be, <laughs> kept kind of hovering into my head. Um, very extreme moments of, 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 of feeling miles away and, and also things rumbling up to the surface, which I hadn't expected. Uh, very rich, but I kind of loved it too. And what I did is what I always do in times of crisis is I go to the studio and I, I kind of draw, I kind of open up, I try to connect, I try to disconnect. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, the, the studio is uh, strangely a safety net for me. And uh, I was comfortable there, um, you know, and, and uh, I don't know, stretch strange memories. And I, I forget that lockdown is, straight, is bizarrely still going on. So uh, again, uh, it feels miles and years away. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, I really, I really liked what you're saying about the, the, that feeling of closeness and farness at the same time, you know, the, the, the safety net of the studio at the same time, that feeling of distance from, from others as well. Um, and the studio is a safety net. That's a wonderful idea. Uh, Keith, uh, what, what's your experience been? Um, well, apart from the obvious, obvious worry about family, friends, people's health, and feeling like you're in some sort of apocalyptic shit show um it's been hard managing OCD issues so contamination issues that I'd learned to deal with when I was at Bethlehem suddenly I'm being asked to clean and wash and do all of these things so it's maintaining a balance between what's right for Covid and what was really OCD in the past and also at the beginning not being able to go out and do things sort of went against everything I had to learn to manage my intrusive thoughts. So it's in a way it's been like relapsing into the old me, but without my control. So constantly fighting to remain my re remain in my recovery. And I know it's been the same for a lot of people that I was in hospital with. So it's been difficult in that way. Artistically, I've had no access until the past few weeks to a studio. So for me, I haven't, didn't touch clay for seven months and that was driving me insane. And I, I led to photography and taking photographs on my daily walks and then making sketchbooks, almost documenting everything that's been going on and scrapping it all together for my own sanity in a way. Thank you, Keith. Great lead into my next question, I think, I think there really, of course. So um, in a sense, you know, there's, there's been a lot of research and work over recent years, quite, quite prominently um, work by the Arts Council um, into, into that relationship between the arts and, and well-being. And, and from what you're saying, Keith, it's, it's almost like you, you use those tools of photography and, and sketchbooking and, and bringing things together as, as part of, of your way of managing that period. Um, so my next question really is, is I wonder what the panelists think about that relationship between creative work and, and our own sense of, of well-being as, as artists or writers or, or, or makers, really. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, Mark, for, the, for this question. Um, I'm aware you, you, you've been working at a project with the Wellcome Trust as well, exploring related issues, I think. Um, what are your reflections on that relationship, creativity and well-being? Well, I think, I mean, there's, there's, there's the, the, the project, I think there's two sort of strands to it for me because I, I, I'm my, my art education is sort of very much and sort of conceptual kind of basis which can have this effect of you know meaning that basically you have to sort of think everything through before you do everything and I'm unfortunately not someone who is very good at going into a situation where there's a kind of you know blank canvas and just doing something which I and, and that's where I kind of feel a lot of the benefit of creativity is is actually in the making 
and quite often for me it's what I do is led by places or spaces you know I kind of seek out kind of opportunities to to make things happen and the work in a way is a can't really exist without that space so it was a very kind of unique challenge this this period in a way the studio felt quite a daunting place rather than a comforting place for me because I kept going there thinking what do I do you know where's where's this going to go how does it work who's it for um so and I, I I have managed to kind of find some time to to make some stuff without any aim recently which has been quite good um though it makes me feel quite uncomfortable as well um gradually stuff is kind of coming back on on line in in terms of starting to get into some a lot of the, actually one of the projects that I was working or working on was um based in three different London PQ units and obviously that kind of went completely offline I mean it's now looking like we'll start to work again on those projects in October so that that's good news um so I guess what I'm saying is as an artist I feel slightly guilty that I probably haven't sort of um you know taken my own medicine and been as creative as I should have been for my own mental well-being in this period Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, that's, you acknowledge there that, that idea of, you know, that, that there are the benefits in the making. And it's interesting you talk about sort of the benefits are perhaps located in, in, in working without an aim or, or there's some sense of freedom there, I think. Um, OK, Simon, I, I wonder, as I, as I explained in, in my introduction, you know, your paintings and drawings have have been described as diaries of the subconscious. Um, I wondered if, if, if there was something in that idea um, that, that kind of making for you is in a similar way, a, a form of sort of expressing that, that inner life or exploring it in some way. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, weirdly enough, you know, firstly, one of the, the main reasons for making art, I've always said to people is it actually bizarrely opposite to Mark, it keeps me off the streets, which I kind of need. Um, so isolation was a sort of good place for that to happen. And um, perhaps, you know, in contrast, Mark, you know, it's that the, for me, the blank page is the limitation I absolutely needed um, because I sort of suffer from a kind of more is not enough uh, complaint uh, where it's almost impossible for me to disseminate or, or choose or, or really even conceive of things in any kind of clear or logical way. So. The limitation of the blank page, automatic drawing, that sort of experience of internal work is, um, it necessarily works, you know, the blankness of that works with uh, things that I can't control or things that are internalized. Um, but that internalized world is not really so much, um, you know, about me, but, but more about um, accessing things around me or things reciphered through the subconscious. So uh, uh, there's a lot of, um, it's very important. There's a lot of kind of time traveling in the work. There's a sort of sense in which it's made through the performance of making now. Um, and that can go anywhere. Um, and that can, you know, and I, I'm not, and more and more over the years, I've tried to hand it over. So I'm less in control, less present, um, really conducting a kind of a, a series of possibilities. Um, and I think, um, you know, I don't know what this says about me, but but somewhere in the back of my kind of mind a long time ago, I was thinking of the Marquis de Sade and how he was sort of trapped in a cell and would every day write and every day those writings were taken and destroyed and he would, it wouldn't stop him from writing again. And I loved somehow, uh, perhaps I sort of envisaged myself in some kind of a prison. I, I needed kind of simplicity. Um, uh, you know, very limited uh, tools in order to then dig with the things both in and out. And of course, life is absolutely crucial in the material that, that I work with, but not in a logical, straightforward uh, way. And so the subconscious is a sort of circular way in which I can, I can focus and unfocus, which I need, you know, uh, for me to uh, gain surprise and activate connection. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, so so it's really interesting. Of course, you know, sometimes everything gets lumped together, doesn't it? It's sort of, the, you know, there's creativity and there's one way of working, but it's really interesting that contrast between 
mark and those challenges of the, the conce sort of conceptual approach and, and sort of aim oriented with, with that more instinctual, the, the flow of creativity, I think that's it's fascinating. Um, of course, perhaps, I don't know if there's similarities or differences for you, Rowan, as, as a writer, how, how's, how's your relationship or your understanding of that well-being, creative writing connection potentially? Okay. Yes. Um, so I think something I want to say, because I teach as well, and I know that a lot of my students can hit a wall where their work isn't going well and where it has been up until that point, holding them up mentally. And when the work leaves, they can feel really, really lost. So I do think for anyone listening who finds creativity a useful way of helping them with their mental health, I agree it is incredibly valuable, but there are other ways to, should your creativity be hiding from you? So that's my teacher brain. Um, my, my, for me, I find that I do my best work when I'm barely aware of myself in terms of either thinking, oh, Rowan, she's so great, she's a genius, or like, I'm terrible, how dare I write? That They're both very unhelpful and that I write best, especially the first draft, um, when I am so entirely in the world that I'm writing that I'm, of course, it's all formed for me, but I don't realize that. I believe that those people are real temporarily. I believe in this world. And I think when I am able to do that, and then I come back to myself, it provides me with great clarity and peace because my mind can be a very cluttered, jangled self-arguing place and to narrow it down to this one voice that is the voice of a story is incredibly helpful. I, I write and I've said the word incredibly like three times now anyway. Um, but the flip side of that is when there are too many voices and there's too much self-doubt, I think especially in times where you feel as an individual very responsible to address the moment and you also feel very small and possibly unable to address the moment it can be hard to find that one clear voice of the story. And so I think, I, I guess maybe what I'm trying to say is I find that my creativity, creativity for me and mental health can end up in very good spirals or slightly unfortunate spirals. And when they're in the unfortunate spirals, I have only learned in recent years through therapy to say to myself, maybe do something stupid and then come back to doing something exciting and creative later. Exactly, Th thank you, Rowan, that's, that's fascinating. I, 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 I completely identify with that myself, you know, having, having taught art to, uh, to students for a number of years, it's often people often get led on that route that, that you know, being creative is, is fundamentally good for the mental health. But of course, you know, with, with creativity, there's always that sense of, of self-doubt and those kind of critical questions that we turn on ourselves, I think. Um, but I, I, I love that idea of, of sort of be, being in the world of the writing. There's a, there's a sense there of, of escapism, of sort of stepping away from some of those thoughts and perhaps almost entering into a, a flow state, as they say, of kind of, you know, of concentration and just being purely involved in the act of, of creation. Um, Keith, how, how about you? I'm, I'm aware sort of, you, you know, ceramics is, is perhaps that world that you enter into in the ceramic studio. Could you, could you tell us about your reflections on, on well-being and creativity for you? Yeah, um, I've not been able to create until the past few weeks what I really wanted to do, but what I've learned a lot um, is compassion and I'm um, being compassionate to yourself which is something I've always struggled with and I think in these times it's about not beating yourself up and not achieving something I mean there's a lot of social media influence that um, we see every day and social media is fantastic for being an artist but also you're constantly bombarded with people that have created an amazing new body they've sorted their house out they've decorated something they've become a master baker or they've created a renaissance painting and you sit there and think it's two o'clock I'm still in my pants playing candy crush you've got to be kind to yourself we can't do everything every day try again the next day and I think that's the biggest thing I've learned from all of this. Just take each day at your own pace. And if you create something, that's fantastic. But if you don't, try again tomorrow. Thank you, Keith. Again, again it's that mixed pleasure, sorry, sort of mix of, of pleasure and pain, <laughs> I suppose. Again, that, that pressure 
to create and, and sometimes not being able to or, or things not quite flowing. Okay, so so in a sense, that, that, that's some, some reflections from a, a maker's perspective or the creator's perspective. Um, what, you know, my next question is really about the audience perspective and, and what, what, in a sense, art can bring or, or writing or any form of creativity can, can do for that audience, I think. Um, so maybe if I begin with, with you, Rowan, your, your novel, Starling Days, um, you know, it explores that, that theme of, of, of mental health. And in a sense, you know, it's, it's not a, a recipe book for a cure or anything. It's a very honest sort of narrative um, about simply experiencing um, um, depression and, and, and suicidal thoughts, really. Um, so w when you were writing the book, what, did, you, did you have an aim? Did you have the audience in mind? Did you intend it to help in some way? Or, or what, was your, what was your approach there? Okay, so I think the books I've loved most, whether they were about mental health itself or not, are the books that make you feel less deeply alone. Because I went through a phase when I was 14 of being very upset that I could never be inside anybody else's brain, you know, <laughs> that, that somehow you... Even there's, there's all of this history of philosophy about it, but I felt it deeply, deeply and very rawly that I could, that my brain would float until my death alone and that I would never be able to purely share somebody else's experience of being alive. And I think for me, the best literature or the literature that moves me most, I don't want to say best, there's so many ways of saying best, but the literature that moves me most captures something of what it is to be a mind in the world, whether that's a healthy or an unhealthy mind. And when you have those sparks of recognition as a reader where you go, yes, that is exactly the way to describe that thing that I have never had words for. And I think because those are the books that meant the most to me, it's always what I've aspired to do is to not, I don't write memoir, but to write something that feels true in the fictional sense that it, it capture some part of being alive and for me mental health is only it's part of having a brain <laughs> and it, sometimes your brain gets sick and I wanted to write about that because although there were books I thought captured it well I felt very bombarded by narratives that didn't feel fictionally true to me often stories where a character was saved from dying and then everything's fine that we're done you didn't kill yourself so it's all it's all great roses um or you know where equally some there were lots of books where someone would kill themselves and it would be a one-off and then they would be dead and everyone would be very sad and that happens that really happens in the world but i had known many people who had very long and quite fraught journeys through their mental health and i never i never saw that battle or never. I very rarely saw that battle depicted in fiction. And to me, that is a battle and it's a battle worth reading and worth writing about as much as any battle or hero's journey, maybe more, you're not even killing other people. And so I, wa I wanted to tell a story about that and to ask, sorry, I don't want to go on because I know everyone else has interesting thoughts, but, um, and also to see it from the point of view of the person who isn't sick and to think about what pressures that puts on them. Because we often talk about supporting a suicidal person, but what does it do to their family, to their loved ones? And what does it mean to choose to stay with someone who you love for their brain, but who when their brain is sick? Indeed. Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, I, I, I tweeted the other day, sort of on my second reading of your novel, as, as you're aware, I think. But, but, it, but definitely, I, you know, my own personal reading of the book, you know, I, I definitely felt that feeling of, of connection in a sense of being able to identify with, with some of those experiences and, and as you say it's it's it's, a, it's about the character but it's about the family and friends and, and these other sort of connections and, and, and yeah that feeling of, of countering that feeling alone being able to identify um perhaps from a slightly different approach mark you're you're i mentioned before your your billboard project and um please believe these days will pass um in a sense, with that project, as, as a public project, project of course, it, it's public oriented. Really. Do, do, you, do you go into these projects with, a, with an aim of the impact or, or how, how does that work when you're thinking about the audience? Well, I think, I mean, quite often I think about these projects in, in terms of 
them being a kind of point of discussion or a point of dissonance or a point of kind of you know an unusual presence in in the in a public space so there's something in a way which I like the fact they're slightly unknowable to me like I won't ever like you know I have my thoughts about what those kind of works mean and I suppose I, I'm able to you know through having you know done it for a long time have some sort of understanding of the kind of what I'm presenting and how it might be thought of or how the kind of questions or conversations it might initiate but ultimately that all happens outside of me like it, I, I like that letting go that's my that's my kind of disengaging brain bit is you know the, I, the creative bit for me is in there's the idea and then there's the drawing bit which happens normally inside a computer and that's the bit where I'm kind of a bit freer and I am just seeing what's right until I get to a kind of right emotional kind of visual temperature you know between an image and words and then I let it go and this particular project was a strange one because um, the original, and I'll, I'll try and keep this very brief, but that text, Please Believe These Days Will Pass, was something I wrote in, it was a title of an exhibition I had in 2012 when I was away in Canada on my own doing a residency. And it was very much uh, about, you know, a personal kind of situation. And then um, a few years later, just after the Brexit referendum, I was asked to make a kind of poster which you know, would go out on the streets. And I, I again, I, I kind of revisited that text thinking about how its meaning had changed within the, you know, the political context at the time. And as lockdown happened, I noticed on social media that a lot of people were kind of sharing images of that work again. So it felt to me like it was kind of in public consciousness and then very strangely and very quickly this opportunity came up to make a new version of the work which went out all over the UK um, and it was very strange because I experienced it pretty much the same as everyone else did via social media and there was a you know there was a month of um, you know that happening and and, and you know I it was it was kind of bizarre like virtually every day it would be used on um, news editorial like if you could get a shot of someone walking past with a face mask on it was like it would just get dropped in and it was never credited at all to start with that was another battle trying to get some sort of credit you know accreditation for it but you know when I actually finally saw one of the works in East London it was a really strange fit you know strange to you know thing to finally kind of meet your child as it were like a long time after everyone else had so that was that was quite a strange and humbling experience um and it was interesting to see uh, again a lot of the time these projects i don't really know how people feel about them but because this was very much happening over social media i, I guess I, I knew a bit more um and i feel that it was read in a kind of much more optimistic way perhaps than i personally he saw it. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Um, Keith, I, I, I'm, a, I'm aware, I, I, I think I, I saw in your Instagram, you, you did post a, a snap of, uh, of, Mark, of Mark's poster, I think during lockdown. So obviously it's something you encountered um, through, through, through the lockdown period. Um, I wonder, Keith, whether, whether what your reflections are on this, because as a, you know, you're, you're currently studying um, ceramics and I'm aware in previous exhibitions, you, you have intended, you know, coming from that position of OCD, you had intended your works for, for viewers to, to touch and, and engage with them in a different way. Do, do you have any reflections or do, do you think about the audience when you're making your work? Um, well, firstly, Mark's um, work really did inspire me because coming out um, into Clerkenwell and suddenly seeing that, I didn't feel quite so alone. So even though it might not have been intended in that way, it, it was really powerful. And I tagged you, Mark, don't worry, you got credit. <laughs> but Thank you. for me, um, a lot of, I think, as you know, Ian, my, my, I'm not as profound with my um, creative. I just love making shit, basically. And I just want to do it and it makes me feel better and it makes me feel happy. So the stuff I've documented, though, via sketchbooks, I've shown to a few people and they said it's actually a really nice record of almost like a historical record of what we've been through that could be shared with 
my nephew when he's older or other people. So that that's one aspect. But for me, in the, the last few weeks, to actually just get back in a studio, the actual having my hands in clay again was just so therapeutic and made me feel so good and the feeling of starting something again. But everything feels odd still. Being in a studio wearing masks with screens everywhere and starting to recreate stuff or finding stuff on the shelf from a project that was abandoned in March. Everything's got a new perspective and everything's got a new feel about it. So it feels like everything stopped on pause and I'm trying to restart, but I don't really know where I'm going. That's the honest truth, if that makes any sense. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, Simon, what, what are your reflections? As you, have you talked before, it's always, you know, that the way you work and the nature of your work comes from, from a very personal place. Uh, do, do you ever have the audience in mind? Do you, do you ever intend your work to, to help anyone else? Or, or is that an after, in a sense, an after effect? Um, I think it's, I think um, in the case of my work, it sort of comes from the subconscious, but it, in a way, uh, but it also speaks to the subconscious. And um, I have no control over um, how people perceive or relate or interrelate, but it's always um, gratifying when there is a connection that's made or, or people uh, find, uh, you know, some kind of identification with what I'm doing or saying. But um, I think really it would, would, couldn't work for me if I was trying to second guess how that would, you know, how people would react or respond or how I can communicate because quite often I try to wait, make work that I don't understand anyway. That's a sort of prerequisite. So it's kind of bigger than me and it's going to energize me and it's going to kind of give me some kind of present later on um, in the work. And I, I, um, and it, it has to be very much made from the kind of the now space or the now, the now moment. So to a certain extent, it's already out of my control. Um, it's odd because, you know, I had a show that was uh, temporarily closed uh, during lockdown and various other shows that, that um, have been postponed um, and art fairs and God knows what. And I absolutely couldn't give a damn. It sounds a really odd thing to say. I just, you know, really uh, liked uh, this opportunity to be hermetic and to uh, somehow for it to be out of my control. I really quite liked the idea that um, there was, I think Keith mentioned, but, you know, the idea of kind of no guilt. You know, you, you literally had this time to uh, one day at a time uh, to respond and react and make accordingly. And I, you know, and I felt a kind of curious freedom out of working with what I had, rather than that strange kind of gallery careerist thing, which is a little bit more like, what should I be doing? Somehow steering things towards an unconscious idea of public or context. But the most importantly for me, um, it, weirdly enough, is even when work is on show, uh, the most important thing is, is you know, probably like Keith, it's back in the studio making new work. It's an odd thing, but I'm only as good as I am today. Nothing else exists. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that that sort of shift in a sense of, you know, that of, of a, a slight relief path for, for some of us, you know, for shifting from what should I be doing to, to potentially, you know, thinking about what am I doing and, and being present and, and just being in the moment with, without that guilt, as you say. Okay. Um, so my, my final question before we take a few from, from our audience this evening, um, the, the theme for, for this year's festival is, is recovery, um, particularly in relation to, to the lockdown and COVID and um, whether we're coming out of lockdown, maybe we're heading back in, I think. Um, and so I'm interested in the panel's perspective on, on, on one, just the idea of, of recovery in relation to mental health and, and how we might think of that word um, and do we recover and, and potentially on, on, on what you think art or, or writing or, or any kind of creative activity, what its role is in, in a sense of recovery. Um, perhaps perhaps I'll, I'll begin with you, Keith. Um, what, what are your reflections on recovery? For me, um, well, for me, art is absolutely integral to recovery. And I only discovered that really when I was in hospital. 
I found that going to occupational therapy and being able to do painting and ceramics or anything that was around really it balanced out the emotional therapy I was having alongside that and it gave me an external focus where my mind was completely away from the horror that was going on and then obviously when I left Beth and part of my recovery plan was to engage with something and City Lit was something I discovered with my occupational therapist and sort of looked into that initially it was just to see if I could get out of bed in the morning and and achieve something but it has massively helped me maintain slipping back into a relapse of, of OCD so it's been massively integral for me and the, the further I've gone the more I've realized how important art is obviously everything locking down brings all of that to a massive shuddering halt and you, you're trying to do your best at home see what you can do and for me it's been this constant terror that am I about to relapse and almost creating more anxiety because you're anxious about relaxing so you're trying to fight that even more art for me is is recovery that's the only way I can put it it's helped me maintain my recovery and the fact that City Lit's managed to reopen again to allow students in has, has been fantastic because I was getting to the point where I was desperate for that space and for me not only the ability to come in and, and work and learn and play but the ability to be out be challenging my intrusive thoughts by being outside again and also to meet friends which is something I, I gained from being at City Lit so art has given me recovery friendships and a better perspective and outlook on life but at the moment I think like everybody we're all grasping to hold on to it as we feel like we're being sort of drag down a plug hole, if that makes any sense. Yeah, thank, thank you, Keith. Yeah, as, as you suggest, in a way, one, recovery isn't a magic bullet, and you, you've indicated that, that collection of things that, that has helped you, the, the connections with other people and the friendships, along with the work and along with the creativity, along with learning, potentially, as well. Um, and you, you also use the phrase, you know, maintaining my recovery. Again, it's it's... It's something that, that is ongoing that we, we continue to work on, I think you're, you're saying that. Um, yeah. Rowan, do you, do you have a reflection on that? Because it, it makes me think of, of Starling Days um, and the narrative you've got there where, where the character has, you know, charts her up days and, and down days in a sense through that. And, and in a sense, there's not this crescendo to, to the positive. Okay, so... For those of you who have not read my great work, it's fine. Um, it, it opens with a character who, when she was much younger, was diagnosed and was put on medication and the medication stops working when she's an adult. And she gets picked up on George Washington Bridge by a couple of policemen who think that she's gonna jump and the book sort of spirals from there. And so in some ways it's about relapse and sort of in worse relapse than before worth well, being worse than you were before in certain ways and the book is driven by a great desire to recover and a great hunger to recover that chases in many different directions and I I don't think you can write characters who you believe you're smarter than and have the book be good otherwise the book just tastes patronizing so I don't know that I believe that character could go in a different way but I think for me I think it's very dangerous to think of sort of re recovery and not recovery as sort of a binary as two binary states and I was actually very moved by um, Mark's descriptions of how people kept looking to his sentence and say and saying oh these these days and then a new set of terrifying days would occur and I think for me, I set myself up for problems if I start to think, oh, it's just these days and then it will get better because the world does like to keep throwing things at you and at itself. And so I think, I, I do believe there are moments of desperation and there are moments of contentment, but I agree it's very much a continuing thing that you have to be aware of and keep an eye on in yourself and adjust each day rather than thinking, you know, I did, I did it now, I'm recovered. I never need to think about my brain again. 
Indeed, yeah, that, that, that self-awareness, that reflection, and, and just being, you know, being, I, th I think that's so important, isn't it? That being aware of where we're at each day. That, that's one thing I, I kind of took from, from reading the book. Um, Mark, do, do, you, do you have any reflections on, on this idea of, of, of recovery for, from your book? Very much to identify with what Rowan was saying earlier, I was th thinking about how art can be this incredibly therapeutic thing, but actually something which causes me <laughs> a certain degree of anxiety. Um, and I think, you know, as as with, I'm sure everyone feels, you know, when something is important to you, it can become overburdened. Um, and when that's kind of conflated with it being your job, and you're suddenly, you know, worrying about how we're going to survive, you know, in the creative industries in the next six months or a year, you know, it all, it all becomes too much. So the idea of being creative in that space becomes very difficult. And I think that's, you know, myself, I, I slip into that kind of cycle quite, um, quite a lot and have to, uh, like you said earlier, go and do something kind of um, silly. So it's, um, though I should do more of that. But I, I suppose just understanding that the cycle is just endless and that it can things change very quickly from one day to the next. It's, it's sometimes everything can seem to be, you know, going on quite nicely and the next day you feel completely different and there's no discernible reason why. Thank you, Mark. Um, finally, Simon, do you, do you have anything to, to, to add on, on, on the subject of, of recovery and your reflections on it? Um, <clears throat> yes, it's it's quite a um, it's quite a kind of loaded word for me, recovery and well-being. I think the two things are kind of strangely interconnected. And um, you know, personally, I've been part of a, a recovery program for alcohol, anonymous, uh, for the last six years, and we talk a lot about recovery. And there's a lot of sort of processes and things that we can do to help maintain serenity and some kind of stability with our heads really, and in a, in a kind of uh, bonkers world. Um, and I, and you know, and I, I so I've, I've got very used to and grown and learned to understand how important recovery is, or for me personally, well-being. Um, I take that very seriously. It's more important than art. And, and even though as, as Keith says, art is a fantastic form of recovery. Uh, it's, it is my oxygen. I absolutely need it. I can't live without it. Uh, but I also know that my well-being and my, 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 what I call my recovery has to be the most important thing. And that's really important because that sort of right-sizes everything, um, puts things into perspective, uh, realises that, you know, life us is the crucial thing in a sense. And we're also, there are lots of tools that we use like service and so forth, teaching is certainly one of them, um, and handing it over, really important, and realizing we're not always in control, we can't be in control. If we are in control, we get into trouble. One of the things about lockdown, which was so interesting for me, was that we were very vehemently not in control. We are very vehemently not in control. And so in a strange way, um, you know, I felt I had a few tools that I could use to help to work with that. Thank you, thank you, Simon. Okay, for, um, I'm going to take a few questions from the audience now. Um, so we have a, have a question that I always find this is quite a tricky one for artists, it is, is those recommendations. So um, we have a question, how do you suggest you best use creativity art to help your mental health? Um, so what, one thing I've noted down is, is do something silly, which, which I think came from Rowan and then was echoed by Mark. So, so that's, that's one, one suggestion um, of, of sort of what, what people might do for, to, to, to help with their well-being. Um, do we have any other, does anybody have any other suggestions of, of sort of that positive approach to working creatively? Um, Mark, but perhaps do you, any, any sort of advice for our audience out there? <laughs> well, actually, I think what Keith was saying was probably, you know, um, something about materiality and about actually kind of, you know, physically experiencing um, the process of making and, the becoming of something I mean I I I, I do that in a probably a, a less free way in in the studio with you know tasks 
boring things actually quite laborious things like masking stuff out and cutting you know stuff that it, but to me that's the clay that's the kind of bit of you know I'm just I'm just my thoughts are I'm mechanically set and my thoughts are kind of off somewhere else and I'm not really too conscious I'm, I'm kind of happily going about my business so I think um we all have our own kind of clay and it's just kind of find finding what that material is can be something which is very freeing Fantastic. Yeah. F find, do something silly and find your clay. That's, that's a wonderful thought. Um, what about for, for, from a writing perspective, Rowan? Um, as you mentioned earlier, you, you, you teach as, as well as write. Do, do, is there any advice you can offer for, for writers out there of how, how they might use it to help them? I, I, would, I would sort of say two short things. Um, one, Mark was talking a bit about in the art world, sort of the, wait, this is my job and I need my job to be good. And I need, you know, and, and the sort of professional aspect of your work and the, that purpose that sort of maybe running alongside the therapeutic work sometimes, but sometimes headbutting it. And I think it can be quite useful to have a creative work that isn't your career and isn't something that you intend necessarily for lots of other people to see. So actually, a sketch that's what that's what that's what I do to um go into a different brain place but I know people who journal and they and it's writing and they're novelists and they publish their novels but they're journaling they don't share and it is and it separates for them the creative aesthetic work and the work that is just for it being for a therapeutic purpose I think the other thing I would say is if you're a writer the best thing about being a writer is it's incredibly cheap. You can do it on your phone, you can do it on your computer, you can do it on a scrap piece of paper. There is endless blank blank page. And I know some people hate the blank page, but I think it's great. It will never leave you. All of your lovers can leave you and there will be still the blank page. And if you don't like this one, there will be a new one and a new one and a new one. And just to feel really safe and held by that. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, that, I think that's a great idea. Of course, you know, ha having that, saving that space for the creative work that's outside of, of those other pressures, work pressures and, and things like that, and almost like a side project. Or sometimes in most cases, that might be more important <laughs> than anything else. Thank you, Rowan. Um, again, the, the blank page reminds me of something you said earlier, Simon. Do you, do you have any advice that, of, of how, you know, approaches people could take to use creativity? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think fear is one of the big, the big issues, isn't it? Um, with opening up and so forth in, in our, and uh, I think, um, do you know, uh, the, the, the trick I think, it, you know, as a, as a, as a maker is to, is to work with, to see yourself as just another material. I, I try to encourage that uh, students if I'm teaching, uh, is to go with whatever's there at the time, that's whatever's in your head, don't fake it, don't force it, you know, and if you're having a discombobulated day, be discombobulated, you know, celebrate it, enjoy it, you know, if you fuck up, if you make mistakes, it's great, uh, you know, use that as part of the language of the work, these things will be more truthful and more kind of, in a sense, connected than if you try to model your, in, your internal life around the idea of what you think is expected of you, uh, and I think... So I think making mistakes and I, I and, and working with failure um, is important. But I also, if I, you know, find myself quoting sometimes Mary Poppins and and that that kind of find the fun in everything you do. And I think sometimes that's incredibly important if you can just find some fun, uh, you know, just one day at a time. Don't worry about where it's going to go. Just work with your hands. Let them speak. Uh, that works for me. It keeps me off the streets. You know. Wonderful. Find the fun. That's great. Uh, Keith, do you, do you have anything to add? Uh, any advice from you as a, as a, as a you know, emerging artist in a sense? Well, I've actually found, and writing isn't my thing at all, but writing stuff down has helped just making little notes on my iPhone because there's so many emotions going on at the moment. And sometimes I've been finding myself getting intensely angered by stuff. And just to come home and write it out, is really cathartic for me. It puts it to one side. And I've also been sort of printing and adding these to my sketchbooks so that I'm documenting my thoughts throughout the process. Um, again, 
obviously for me it's all about having fun but something I've learned through my own therapy is to sometimes try and challenge yourself by doing one thing every day that's quite scary to you and whether that be in your your art form doing something different that you're not used to or just something in life in general if you can manage it the sense of achievement after for example doing this talk today I hope to feel a sense of achievement because I felt so absolutely petrified for most of the day before we came online. So doing something each day that scares you slowly rebuilds you. And if someone had said this to me 10 years ago, I'd have wanted to punch them in the face because I just wouldn't have believed it. But now I really do get that, if that helps anyone. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, I'm not sure whether to ask this question. It might open a can of worms. We, we, we slightly change the topic almost. Um, so we, we, we briefly mentioned, um, you know, the, Mark, your work on social media. Um, so, so we have a question from the audience. And do, do we think social media helps with mental re resilience? Um, perhaps, Mark, if, if you, you had any thoughts on this subject, do you, do you think social media is, is beneficial for mental health, perhaps through the sharing of art or creativity? Hmm, is what I would say. Uh, <laughs> I think sometimes it, it I, my experience during lockdown with it was it in at certain points it helped me connect with people outside of my family group and it helped me feel, you know, that I wasn't isolated in my experience quite so much. Um, and it was a way of, for me, of my art kind of existing, but you know, I do find myself virtually daily thinking I need to stop looking at, you know, and I'm not a big user of social media either, but I, I will post something on Instagram and then I'll probably, it will traumatize me for a week and then I'll maybe look at it again. So there's, you know, I, I, I think it creates as much anxiety as it relieves. Indeed. Yeah, it's right. It's someone was telling me yesterday about the from that Netflix documentary about social media. It says the only people who call their customers users are, are, are drug dealers and uh, and social media companies. I don't know. Yeah, Keith, do, do you have any sort of re reflections on on social media? I know you're a, you're an avid user of Instagram. Do, do you find that beneficial for you? Um, I totally agree with what Mark said. Really, it is for me. It's been great for connection. It's great to share my art. It's my personal one's more like a, a, a journal to myself to see what I've achieved since leaving hospital um, a few years ago. My art account is more about trying to create myself. But on the flip side of the great stuff, it can just make you feel so low sometimes, especially during lockdown. You see people that are, like I said at the beginning, achieving so much and you just feel like a complete massive failure but you've got to take social media as what it is it's people putting the best part of their life forward no one's going to put what's really happening on the worst stages I mean it's why I came off of Facebook years ago because it just really really depressed me but I think if you can look at social media and understand how fake some of it is and take it with a sense of humour, providing you're in the right frame of mind, it can be great, but it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword, really. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, I'm afraid to say we're, uh, we're out of time. Um, it's very odd doing this on Zoom. I'd, I'd usually ask for a round of applause. <laughs> it's very difficult to do this. Um, but a huge uh, thank you to, to our four panellists. I mean, I mean, really fascinating insights, um, wisdom, and, and, and hopefully some, some inspiration um, for our audience. Um, just a reminder to, to everybody that our, our festival continues uh, for two more days. Um, and of course, whilst many of our workshops are unfortunately fully booked, there are a number of, of events that you can still book uh, through the website, um, including a panel discussion tomorrow um, from Dr. Catherine uh, Mannix on, on uh, illness, uh, death and dying. So a, a way of thinking through and, and ideas around these, these topics that are perhaps very much part of the present for, for many people. Um, on behalf of the panel, uh, may I just wish you all the best of health um, for the future. Um, and thank you for, for joining us this evening. Um, good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.